For at TV, the world is thinking. Let's go back to that example I gave at the outset of cash for good grades or for reading books. Why hesitate to pay a child for getting good grades or reading a book? The goal is to motivate the child to study or to read. The payment is an incentive. And economics teaches that people respond to incentives. While some children may be motivated to read books for the love of learning, others may not. So why not use money as a further incentive? Two incentives surely work better than one, the economist might argue. But is that right? Or might it be that the monetary incentive undermines the intrinsic one, leading to less reading rather than more? Or to more reading in the short term, but for the wrong reason? So what begins as a market mechanism may become a market norm. And the worry in the case of paying kids to read is that we may be habituating children to think of reading books as a way of making money. And that might erode or crowd out or corrupt the intrinsic good of reading. Now, is this the way the world works? Well, here's an example that suggests maybe sometimes it is the way the world works. There was a study of some Israeli child care centers. It offers a great example of this. The centers faced a problem that is familiar enough. Parents coming late for the pickup of their children. <laughs> and a teacher had to stay to look after the kids until their tardy parents arrived. So to solve the problem, the child care centers imposed a fine for late pickups. Now, what do you suppose happened? <laughs> Late pickups increased. <laughs> now, how could this be? How could this be? What would the economist say? If you assume that people respond to incentives, this makes no sense. <clears throat> what happened? What happened, I think, is that introducing the fine changed the norms. Before, parents who came late felt guilty. They were imposing an inconvenience on the teachers. Now, parents considered a late arrival a service for which they were willing to pay. <laughs> so rather than imposing on the teacher, they were simply paying her to stay longer. So this shows how market norms can crowd out non-market norms. And it can happen in education, it can happen in child care centers, it can happen with refugees and with immigrants and with military service, which is why we need to think hard about where the market should govern and where letting the market in may erode or damage or degrade or corrupt values that are higher than markets. When we as a society decide that certain goods may be bought and sold, what we are deciding is that those goods are properly valued as commodities, as instruments of profit and use. Whether they are cars and toasters, which are properly commodities, or whether they involve citizenship, or refugee asylum, or teaching children to read books. But not all goods are properly valued as commodities or as objects of use. Some, such as human beings, are properly valued as persons, worthy of dignity and respect. Others, such as natural wonders, our great works of art are properly treated with reverence and awe. The general point is this. Some of the good things in life are corrupted or degraded if we turn them into market commodities. So when we decide when to use markets, it's not enough to think about efficiency. It's not even enough to think about market freedom. We also have to decide 
how to value the goods in question, be they health, education, national defense, criminal justice, environmental protection, and so on. These are moral and political questions, not merely economic ones. And to decide them democratically, we have to debate case by case, just as we've begun to do here, the moral meaning of these goods and the proper way of valuing them. This is the debate that we didn't have during the age of market triumphalism. And as a result, without quite realizing it, without ever deciding to do so, we drifted from having a market economy to becoming a market society.